One of the first things that, um, that we have to do when you get to a job is you have to treat the window openings. And the window openings we treat is with Aquaflash. Traditionally, we would take a roll of Aquaflash mesh, we put it in the inside corner, we would do that, we'd do the bottom sill, we'd do the jam, we'd put a diagonal piece on the end, and Drive It, like we said before, has developed an Aquaflash pre-made corner, which John has in his hand right there, and it comes pre-curved like this. Makes it a lot easier and quicker to put this Aquaflash corner on than to do three or four individual pieces. You want to use latex gloves or other type of gloves because the aqua flash, when it gets on you, it's very difficult for it to come off. Yeah, that's the best thing. If you, if you use aqua flash, it can go directly to the sheathing or it could also go on the backstop. Where if you use the peel and stick tape, you have to go on to the backstop. You can't go on to the sheathing with it. So it wraps all three? Say again? Question? You can use a four inch paintbrush with the aqua flash, you can use a four inch roller. All depends on the preference. That's a four inch piece that we're using now, but we would use a six inch piece on a, on a four inch stud, a two by four. And this isn't a driver requirement, it's a code requirement. The codes tell you that you have to treat the openings, the, the window openings. Yeah. Any penetration. So windows, doors, floor line expansion joints. If you remember in Al's presentation? Hose bibs, any termination behind expansion joints, like I said, behind that expansion joint before you put the foam on top, you'd also have that backstop behind there. In case the sealant joint lets go, years down the road, the water's not going to get in because the backstop's going to hold it, or the aqua flash going to hold it in place. So the nice thing, back to your original question, as it relates to windows needing to get the building dried in, you can go ahead and put this on and Al's mentioned up to six months exposure. So they can go ahead and put the windows in and come back in spring and then you just overlap the backstop right over the top of it. Or if the backstop's there, you can put the aqua flash over the backstop. So it's fluid applied. So it's blue, as you can see, when it goes on. Once it turns black, coat it one more time with a good liberal coat over the top of it. And then let it dry. Two hours later, stick the windows in and move on. Okay? Any questions? Dens glass, national jib, a lot of the sheathings we can use. It's all compatible. Plywood, yes. Plywood, yes. Yep. Durock, sure. Well, there's probably not a substrate we can't we can't use. I mean, if it's a painted masonry, we can go over it with mechanical fasteners. If it's sheathing type, we can just adhere to it. If it's virgin block and not painted CMU masonry, we can stick right to that. But you'll notice too that just like the cut edge of the sheathing, where your flashing tapes and other products won't stick, this stuff sticks. So think in terms of on a project when you're putting the air and water resistant barrier on. Typically you only focus on the areas behind the eave system, right? These products are fully tested to be used behind all claddings. So when you're worried about compatibility, who goes first, who goes last, the foundation, the top of the wall, all the conditions Al spoke of, that can be what you do. So most of the contractors I work with, they bid the entire air water resistant barrier for the entire building envelope not just behind the eaves, okay? So don't miss out on that opportunity, but you'll see with AquaFlash, it stays exactly where you put it. Al said, wear gloves. Please. You're, you're not going to get it off your hands. This stuff really works really well. And very thin. Yes, Bob?
That's correct. So you'll find. What, what you'll find is that just exactly as Bob mentioned, send a lead to a contractor twice. Send it to the distributor. Well, there's no EFs on it. I said, did you look at the air and water resistive barrier? There is no EFs, but 100% of it was backstop and aquaflash. So you have to recognize when you're looking at projects to, that, are, that are specified, not only look at the EFs package, but look behind the other claddings to make sure that the product's not specified there. You sure don't want to be doing it for free. There's a lot of continuity. Just, th just think in terms of everything that we do, whether it's custom brick or limestone, DPR finish. Name one thing that we do that where the aesthetics or the appearance doesn't matter. You make it blue and you make it black. That's all you're trying to accomplish. And so it's, it's something that, is, as Bob just alluded to, make sure that you look at every project because it is an opportunity for you, no doubt about it. Any questions about the aquaflash or, or the backstop material? Yes. Can you go over base coat? Yeah. Uh, for the specific situation or example that you presented, the, o the opening should have already been wrapped before the stucco goes on. I, I realize in some cases that doesn't happen. Right. Uh, still, the, the per code, that opening has to be wrapped and flashed, and that has to go over. So if we're doing stucco, per code, you're supposed to be putting on two layers of weather-resistive barrier. A lot of times, that would be our fluid applied, aqua flash on the inside, and then your paper would go to the opening. Okay? Let's say if we're using paper, paperback lath, that would be that process. So that preparation should already be there prior to that being installed. Now, if you're wanting to, if you've got sheathing for some reason, after that fact, then it still should be wrapped and integrated into that opening so that water can't get behind it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult, guys, and I know where you're coming from. A lot of times you get to the job site and the windows are in. The thing that, the thing that you've got to be very careful with, you almost have to be very proactive and making sure with the aqua flash, you can send somebody out there with a gallon pail and a roller in, in the corners and the aqua flash mesh, and you can do everything that's needed from the inside. The, the day where you can actually show up at the job site when they're completely ready for you and start, that's typically that's very tough to accomplish right now. I mean, it's going to stick. I, I, again, I don't know what the purpose is, but, I mean, it's going to stick. I mean, I, the thing that, you know, the aquaflash materials and, and air and water resistive barriers are tested behind claddings, the brick, the block, the eaves. So they're not intended to be exposed indefinitely as a final finished surface. So when you put the system over the top of them, they're going to perform. And what you're talking about is UV exposure, okay? So the key is, is that should be underneath. People ask about backstop. What's the limitation? What's well, 30 days, right? Well, that's what all manufacturers post. Our products can go well beyond the 30 days. The 30 days, when you think about you're going to adhesively attach the system, you've been on construction sites. Look at all the environmental dirt, the rain, the mud splashes up on the wall. That's to facilitate, without having to clean the wall, that we can stick to it. If you go beyond that, then typically we address it on a case-by-case -case basis. Some cases, we'll write a letter that it can be exposed up to six months. But when it is, it's got to be cleaned, and then a refresher coat of smooth has to be roller applied over the top of it. So that's, that's an example. But I think to answer your specific question, get with Carmine, get with Al on a, on a specific project, show them the exact conditions, and then we can comment specific to that project. Okay? Great question. Any other questions as it relates to the aquaflash and and backstop materials. We okay. also have a VB too, John, which you can okay, run I, them through. And something that, and again, I don't want to get into where it's too technical, but here's the one thing from a fundamental perspective. When you open up a set of drawings, when you're looking at a project, and you look at that wall section, is there cavity bad insulation shown? 
is there not cavity bad insulation shown? The one thing that we offer in our industry is there's four code required barriers, air, water, vapor, thermal. In other words, the EPS, the XPS insulation that you put on a building. What you actually do offers all four. So when we get back to that wall section where there's no cavity bed insulation, that's what's called performance design. So now the vapor barrier, instead of on the inside of the wall, it's now on the outside of the wall. So if you take away one thing today, is when you open up that set of drawings and you look at that wall section that you're bidding and there's no cavity bad insulation, it's highly likely that they're requesting a vapor barrier product, okay? We have one product called Backstop NTVB, when used in conjunction with the off flash, actually achieves the air, water, and vapor barrier all in one product, one application step, okay? The fastest growing aspect of design construction today is performance design. So like the contractors I work with, if you open up a set of drawings and you don't see that there's any cavity about insulation, pick up the phone and have a conversation with Century, with Al, with Paul. And the reason why, when you use the VB, you actually have to have 24 mils of thickness. The easiest way to get there is trial the first coat, and once that basically takes up where you can't disturb it under thumb pressure, trial the second coat, you're good to go. It's the way to go. And it is the vapor barrier as well. But here's the thing, think in terms of we're doing this wall. Standard backstop, if I trial it, all I have to do is treat the joints with the grid tape as shown, treat that joint, and then once I can't disturb it, trial one coat over the top of it, I'm done. But when I do VB, guys, I've got to treat the joint, trial one coat. Then after that takes up, I've got to trial a second coat. That means I've got to go around the building twice. And you think, well, that, that's an additional labor step for you. But now what you've done, though, is you've done all three. The vapor barrier that would have been used on the, on the inside is eliminated, but now the vapor barrier is on the outside. Don't miss that, because that will be your responsibility to make sure that if you're specifying you know, one of our systems, it's got to be the vapor barrier version, and it's called Backstop NTVB. Just keep it in simple terms. I open up the set of drawings, I don't see cavity bad insulation, or I do. If I see cavity bad insulation, standard backstop, whichever version, smooth, texture, spray that you want to use, you can. But if it doesn't have any cavity bad insulation, then there's high probability that they're going to need a vapor barrier on the outside surface of that sheathing, and that's called backstop NTVB. Instead of it being blue in color, it's green in color, and it requires two trial applied applications. Any questions about that? Yeah, the coverages are based on two coats. And the coverage is based upon two coats. Relative to the thermal barrier, yep. uh, you can achieve the same insulator value with just an exterior insulation system? Absolutely. The mindset, great question, Connor And the reason why the construction industry is moving in that direction, think of it in these simple terms. We're sitting inside here today where it's 65, 70 degrees, real comfortable. On the outside, it's abnormally warm. Generally, this time of year, it'd be zero outside. It'd be pretty common. So if you take the wall section, from the inside, 70 degrees, to the outside, it's going to change 70 degrees across that wall section. So if you think in, in terms of light gauge metal frame, we pull the cavity bad insulation out, drywall on the inside, dense glass on the outside, whatever cladding, it's still going to change that 70 degrees. On the inside of the cavity, when you pull that, that uh, cavity bad out, the temperature of the exterior sheathing is only 4 to 5 degrees less than the interior air temperature. All the science is basically showing 100% elimination of mold, mildew, and other performance wall issues that they're concerned about. So like a lot of the firms that I deal with, they're 100% performance design guys. There's no cavity bad insulation involved. Either one is acceptable, but the reason why people are moving in that direction is to eliminate mold, mildew, and other wall performance issues regardless of the cladding. That's why the CI that Al alluded to. When you put foam on the outside, you warm up that cavity. You eliminate the, the cavity back. You warm up the cavity. You don't have a dew point consideration. So recognize the science of construction is changing. It's affecting our industry, but you have a specific advantage when it does go to performance design because of the four required barriers, one product can provide all three 
And that's a product that we offer to you. So don't overlook that. But as Bob mentioned, these products are not just limited to EVEs. We have a lot of projects. One we just got done with, every bit, every square foot on that project, over 450,000 square feet, the contractor did all the air and water resistant barrier. So trust, that's, that's something that you have to be aware of. But again, go back. If you open up that set of drawings and there's no cavity bat insulation, you better be picking up the phone and asking a question until you understand what you're looking at. Okay? Any questions? Great, great question. In Carmen. terms of bit, does that have to be designed at the, in the design phase? It, it's, the already, it's already automatically in there. And what actually happens, a lot of the contractors said, well, the architects made a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. There's two design paths that they can choose from. And so when you make that determination, it's clearly written in the spec. And you can, somebody that's knowledgeable of it, Carmine, you can go in and look, and it's, it'll reference ASTM E96, and the permeance will be 0.1 or less. Well, guess what? Guess what backstop NTVB is? It's 0.008. But you don't have to know that. The key is when you see that there's no cavity band insulation, it's a red flag that until I become accustomed to what's actually happening in the construction industry, I need to pick up the phone and speak with Carmine. I need to pick up the phone and call Al. Okay? It's important to recognize those little things. It's not about just going out and saying, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do this. Because of those changes within the construction industry, you're going to see some transition, and that's why some of these other products are out there and are being developed. But just recognize if we did, took the, the approach where we put Tyvek up, wait a minute, Tyvek's not a vapor bear, so we've got to put another product up there. That's another labor step, another product. Well, are they compatible? Do they provide the code required drainage? Are they fire tested as an assembly? I mean, I can go on and on. The simple fu fundamental fact, prescriptive and performance is something that you're going to be dealing with. Okay? Just one more question. Sure. So I'm an applicant and I want to do some bioengineering and we're uh -huh. outside of design phase. Is it practical that you can make these changes prior to build or will have to emanate that design phase? Well, it, it really depends. Uh, great question. Uh, I'm of the mindset that if, you, if, if we are doing our collective job and actually speaking with that design professional, that already takes place. So once that happens, then we communicate that through you to the contractor base and they know what to expect. The second part of that is a lot of the contractors will wait till within two, three days before bid, Carmine, I need you to call this guy, I want to use this. Well, number one, the design professional is not compensated for changes. I've been told by some of them they have up to 3,500 different products to specify, right? So if I go in two days prior to bid and 10 guys want me to research a new product, how many times do you think that's going to happen when it's uncompensated? Not going to happen. The right way to do is bid the base bid and then submit a voluntary alternate for consideration. That's the right way. And, and I see, I think the other thing, guys, when you're bidding projects, Think of those same terms. Go with the base bid and then, and then build from there. What typically happens in the markets that I cover, they'll open up the spec and the contractor that's really knowledgeable and knows exactly what they're doing, they're bidding exactly what was specified. Then somebody else will come in with a base bid of standard barrier system and then X for moisture drainage, X for the vapor barrier, X for custom brick. Guess what? Guess who gets scope review? The guy with the lowest number. I, I can show you some examples where the guy went in with the, the base bid and came out and got scope review, and their number was higher than the competition, but they got scope review. So you have to be careful with what's going on in the marketplace. But the one thing that you have to be aware of, guys, is things are changing. And that's why these new products are out there as backstop NTVB. Think in terms of the aqua flash. Anybody that's used flashing tape from another manufacturer on a project and you show up the next day, two weeks later, and it's all peeling off, what do you have to do? You've got to replace it. So at a buck a lineal foot, we just threw away because they didn't cover it with the cladding the same work period that they put it up. Aquaflash stays exactly there. The product mix that we try to offer the contractor base is in response to make your job easier. So if you don't understand where that product fits, Ask the question. It's not always about price. It's always about taking a look at what's going to be the most economical, what's going to be the most competitive, 
what's going to make your job easier, but recognize within those code changes and CI requirements, you're going to be using a different mix of products. So, any other questions? Great questions coming.